I would love to see and hear of a time where eventually we're going in to see the doctor to literally do our blood pressure, those types of things when it's necessary. And then for the results call, we can just zoom zoom in or Skype in and just get our results one-on-one with the doctor from their office. And they haven't had us driving in Melbourne traffic. Traffic is an absolute terrible time for me to sit through. It's stressful or does all those things not making us any better. So This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis, helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Bill from recoveryafterstroke.com. This is episode 35, and my guest today is Paul Higgins. Paul is the founder of Build, Live, Give, and a mentor to coaches and consultants, helping them build online businesses and lifestyles. Now, just before we get started, if you have ever wondered what else I can do to help you with your stroke recovery, you should know that I have set up a few recovery after stroke support packages where stroke survivors can come into a community while trying to get better on their own and get help from people who are already further along in their recovery timeline. I too am a three-time stroke survivor and a brain surgery survivor, and I have built for you what I was missing when I was sent home from hospital in the hopes that you don't have to do stroke recovery as tough as I did. Support packages give you access to a variety of tools 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so that you can also work on other areas of stroke recovery that you don't get the chance to at physical therapy or rehabilitation. With tailored support packages available for less than $8.50 per week, all recovery after stroke support packages bring stroke recovery to you in the comfort of your own home. To try out recovery after stroke support and see if it is right for you, you will get the first seven days free as well as a 30-day money-back guarantee, no questions asked. As a bonus, you will get two face-to-face Zoom support calls with myself to take your recovery to the next level. Go to recoveryafterstroke.com forward slash support to sign up now. It won't cost you anything for the first seven days and you will get a full refund if you are not happy after 30 days. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Now it's on with the show. Welcome to the podcast, Paul. Great to be here. What I'd love to talk to you about is what it is that you do, and I've introduced you a little bit in the intro, and I guess we'll have some kind of an idea, but what I'd love to ask you is like, how did you end up being on the other side of that microphone that you are right now? Yeah, look, I'll give you the abridged version. So uh, for my sins, I worked for a large company for most of my life, so for uh, just over 18 years, and that was Coca-Cola. So I had a brilliant career, sort of started as a rep, ended up as a director and uh, it was a brilliant company. But in the back, uh, in my personal life, um, my mum got very ill at, at, at uh, in her sort of mid-40s and we found out there was a, an inherited disease called polycystic kidney disease, not life-threatening, um, but certainly um, made me think about my health. And, and my mum, you know, worked too hard, uh, both in and outside of uh, her working environment, and that led to a, a massive heart attack. We nearly lost her, and she had a pacemaker and realised that, you know, her life was going to change um, from then on. So at 18, I was diagnosed, and, uh, you know, to be honest, uh, it's just cysts that grow in your kidneys and liver. So it didn't affect – it impact me other than a blood pressure tablet. So that was fine. I lived my normal life, you know, corporate working ridiculous hours, 80 hour weeks, flying around the world, etc. And then, um, yeah, sort of as time went on, my kidney function started to decline. And around 2011, my, my surgeon or my specialist said, look, you've got two choices here. One is keep doing what you're doing and you'll be uh, have kidney failure in six months. And that will um, you know, at best, if you can't get a transplant, you got 20 years roughly on dialysis and it's sort of a bit complicated, whatever. And, you know, my kids were, what were they then? About 13 and 11 or something like that, mm. maybe even a bit younger. And I'm like, well, that's not very fair. I'm not going to see their kids and that's not going to really work for me. She said, or oh, try to control it. So in short, I did. So in 2011, I left, I worked for myself and for quite some time, it was very stressful and, mm. you know. I'd actually had probably more stress running my own business and uh, didn't have the money. So it was probably compounded. And my surgeon's like, 
your results are going south in a hurry. Mm. You better go back to corporate. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so, um, so in short, I joined Superfast Business, joined that community. I got some great help from uh, James Ramco, who I'm very thankful for. And then um, I basically created my own community. So, you know, there's a lot of people that escape corporate, not because of health, but maybe for other reasons. I know a lot of your listeners, you know, have health issues with stroke and other things that, you know, life gives, throws you cur- curveballs. And when mm. it does, I just want to help people uh, run their own business successfully. So uh, that's my short version. I, I'm glad you didn't ask me for my long version, but that's my <laughs> short version of uh, how I got to here. Awesome, mate. The short version is pretty cool. Um, so we're going to talk about all the things that you spoke about, but I specifically like what you said about we've taken a leap into running our own small business and now health and well-being actually taking a battering even more because that's one thing people don't realize is when you're running your own small business, you are got no sickies. Um, holiday pay, all that kind of stuff tends to go out the window. And I don't know about you, but when I was working for myself, when I still am, my boss, the worst boss I've ever had. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, look, it's hard to fire yourself. And, and look, I think you're right. I think there's pros and cons, right? So the pros for me is that if I've got to go off to hospital, if I've got to go and see a specialist, I can move my schedule. So that's brilliant. So I can always find time. To, to do that, which in corporate, that was really difficult. And some of your specialists, you know, it takes you three, four months to get into. So um, I think that's the pro. I think the con is, yes, you're constantly thinking about work. So, you know, whilst you're even sitting there in that specialist meeting, it, it becomes a lot more real when you're earning the income and you're at risk if something happens to you, whereas corporate, you can take three months off or, you know, Coke would always support you. Mm that safety net's not there. So that's why in our community, we really try to help people to get a business that is, you know, passive is the wrong word, but it it can sort of run and allow them to manage their health because I think that's that's really critical. And like I said, there's pros and cons of it. But yes, if, if you don't get the right help, it's very easy to get caught up in the fact that you're not working well and that can have a, a negative impact on your health. Yeah. All right, so let's go back a little bit. So you worked for Coca-Cola? Yes. And during that time, so what we're going to do today is we're going to give some insights to people of the mistakes that we made. We'll call them mistakes or you know the the process we were in and then what we could have done to make our time working for somebody else a little better. So I know that you're in the corporate world, you're flying all over the place, you're doing all sorts of hours in hindsight what could you have done with your employer? What kind of conversations could you have had to say to you to say to them, "Look, I'm doing a little bit tough health wise. Can we somehow facilitate some changes that will help me improve my health while I'm here and also have my uh, visitors appo- uh, my hospital appointments, etc. What could you have done differently during that time instead of just go full on? Yeah, look, it's a great question and there's there's sort of two answers one is a you're in the right company so some companies are really have got a great culture they'll support people and i've got to i've got to say in general coca-cola and coca-cola amateur uh was brilliant so um they were good but at a certain senior level you had to put in the hours and if you weren't putting in the hours you you know felt that that pressure so i think getting the right culture and the right environment i think is one thing. I think the second thing is if you, you know, I think is really been um, quite clear with what you want. So I went and said, look, I want to work four days a week, um, sort of manage my health. And also, um, you know, I was looking to see what I do, what are my other options are. And they said, no, look, it's a five, five day a week job that that's it. And I think I would have been, um, I just sort of dismissed and said, okay, you know, I know that's the norm, but I think I really should have dug my heels in. And even if I took a lower level job and work four days a week, I think that would have been a much better option than, than working the five days. Um, so, so there are a couple of thoughts that I've got around how I could have managed it uh, better than what I did. Yeah. So you got to that point where you said you saw that there was no option in changing, you had the conversation 
what was the thought process going through your mind then? Now, I know a lot of stroke um, patients, people that are recovering from stroke, and and I speak for myself more than anyone else because I don't know exactly how everyone else is feeling. But for me, yes, I wake up one morning, all of my income that was dependent on me was now at risk because I was in hospital and I was there for an indefinite amount of time. I didn't know how long I was going to be there. And everyone relying on me could not access me. And um, like I had to make, I had to do something. I had to find a way. And I was lucky because I was still coherent. What yes. had happened to me wasn't, uh, didn't put me out of action to that extent initially. But I know it does with other people. And stroke can be very debilitating very quickly. So how do we, um, how did you go through that process of, changing from a corporate world salary or just even a self self uh, like a salary regardless of where it's coming from to now being out of work and not having that backup what happened there how was the transition yeah look uh, i suppose for me like i said i had a bit of forewarning so you know my specialist had give me I, I was still my brain was fine i was still functioning 100 percent. so i know there's people listening to this that aren't as fortunate as me but i was really fortunate um, that that I had that, and I, I just basically ripped the band aid. So I'd sort of procrastinated for about ten years. Kept saying I had a annual trip that I used to take with some mates, and each year I'd say I'm going to leave, I'm going to, and I just didn't. So one year I just said that's it, um, I'm I'm just going to do it. So I, I basically ripped the band aid. I went and uh, started my own business, and and really didn't know what I was, was doing to be honest. So there was probably two years of really low income. And I had to eat into my savings. So, um, you know, my learnings was don't do it yourself. Like uh, whether it's Bill's community, whether there's other communities out there, sort of get some help um, if you're in that situation. Um, because it, it's amazing how much people will help you. Just, you know, sometimes you, you don't ask. People are waiting for you to ask. They're not going to always yeah. come forward. Nice. I think the other thing is, um, you know, just that rainy day um uh, situation. So I think, you know, it's, it sounds dead obvious and everyone's going to say, you know, wow, Paul, that's a huge revelation, but just spend 20% of your time whilst you are healthy, always thinking of a situation where you may not be because, you know, Bill, you've gone through it. Others listening to this have, but those that aren't, aren't in that situation yet, you know, just think about what you can do. So, you know, I'd spend 20%, so I'd always get an annual med uh, medical checkup. I would, you know, make sure that my finances are in place. Just, you know, just spend that time. And, yes, there's a huge amount of social media and, and you know, there's a lot of things to distract you these days. But just try to get, you know, whether it's a day a week, a half a day a week, and just work on that, that plan because uh, you just never know. Uh, like you, Bill, you are, you know, it, the body doesn't give you – time for my mum it didn't give her mm. time it just basically one day she was fine and then the next day she was you know uh, on the brink of death so um yeah. you know i think it's really important if you are well to uh, prepare ahead of time okay awesome so it's prevention prevention that's a, that's an amazing thing however a lot of us don't think about prevention now what's good about my community as well is there'll be carers listening yes and the carers will hopefully be in a situation where uh, they are actively looking for ways to make their role, their new role, because some of them just take on a new role automatically, uh, easier. And by preparing themselves and taking small amounts of time to allocate to getting better at caring for themselves and for the person they're caring for, they're going to be able to sort of transition a little bit gentler into that process of caring. Now, I want to go back a little bit so for the people who are listening who are survivors, um, who might be young because you were diagnosed at 21, how seriously did you take it at 21? Your health was given you know, a pretty grim outlook. You're still here and it's amazing and you're looking great when I saw you and spoke to you. You're full of energy and I know you're not 100%. Um, you know, your, your kidney is not operating at 100%. How seriously did you take it then, and what do you think you could have done differently? Yeah, look, great. Yeah, so it was actually 18 that I was first diagnosed. I'll never forget the moment when mum basically – I'd look mum in the eye and say, hey, you know, you, you've passed this on to me, which was uh, 
really sad. I could see the pain for her. Um, she couldn't do anything about it. It's just uh, one of those things. But um, for me, it, it really didn't even enter. Like I had really high blood pressure, went on a tablet, blood pressure came down. It was like, just go back to your normal life. So um, I really didn't take it serious enough. And even my wife and I, who, you know, my girlfriend at the time, my mum was like, you know, what you're marrying into and the chances are it's a 50 50 at birth, et cetera. And my wife and I said, you know, look, we'll just deal with that when it comes. So I think it's very hard to fast forward a long time and take the advice of uh, those that are giving it to you. So, you know, I know, you know, a lot of people that are younger, you, you're headstrong. I, I completely get that. But I think um, it is wise to listen to those a little bit older and, and, and just stop for a moment. And for me, I would have, uh, improve my diet uh, straight away. I was too slow to improve my diet. I would have probably taken another career change because I worked way too hard and it was too stressed. My brother's got a similar disease to me. It could be completely unrelated. Well, sorry, he's got the same disease, but his function is much better and he was in a lot, a lot uh, less stress, uh, stressed environment. So, you know, maybe those things I could have taken a lot more seriously than, than what I did. Uh, but I think I did well in 2011. But there was a big gap between, you know, um, uh, 1990 and uh, 2011 where I could have done a lot more. Okay. So what do you do now? What do you do now? How do you look after your nutrition and your well-being now other than how you've changed your work-life balance? Or how do you do that part, the uh, nutrition part? Yeah, well, with my kidney function being so low, if I have anything processed, I, I basically feel it straight away. So so uh, for me, in short, I just try not to have uh, processed food. I don't drink alcohol. Um, you know, obviously I don't smoke. I just uh, have lots of water. And, um, you know, I when I'm tired, I actually take it easy, which for an A-type personality for me, um, you know, is really, really difficult to do. But I, I just know with my body. So I used to ride 700 k's a week. And my specialist kept saying, you know, you're you're pushing yourself too hard. Don't ride in the in the in hot days, all that sort of stuff. And I'm like, I'm fine, you know, I can sort of uh, I can beat it. But um, you know, now I don't. If it's hot, I won't ride. Um, you know, I'll, I'll still still be active, and I and I make sure I go to the gym. I do my stuff, but I, I keep it within reason. And um, you know, I just try to have a clean clean living life. And uh, you know, it, it is hard because those chocolates will come down at the table or, you know, like um, someone will offer you an ice cream. Like there's so much opportunity in today's world to, to eat food that is not uh, great for you. Mm. And you don't want to impose on people by saying, you know, I'm actually, you know, I'd prefer non-gluten or I'd prefer this, prefer that. So, mm. um, you know, in short, it just becomes around discipline and it's, it, it's hard at times. If you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be you're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. But um, yeah, you just gotta be super disciplined because uh, you, you can't say the, t you know, you see your kids and it's hard to translate, well, I'm doing this for them really, I'm not doing this for me. So every time I see something like that, I'm like, well, hang on, just think about them, don't think about you and yeah. and, and forego the short-term pleasure for hopefully uh, a longer-term gain. Yeah, long-term life ex especially. I, um, I, have a lot, I have a lot in common with you, not because of the challenges that we face with our health, but because of the approach that I've also – taken to manage the part of my well-being that I can manage which is what goes in my mouth mostly yes you know which is how often I exert myself because I can go for a bike ride but I can't feel my leg after about a kilometer or two 
and that puts you know me at greater risk of falling over and all that kind of stuff and i'm not sure exactly why the numbness increases as i get more tired but that's what happens my balance gets affected all that type of stuff right i also noticed that the numbness increases depending on the food that i eat so because i've been very clean eating for the majority of the last four years uh, six years um what I notice is that when I eat something that's heavily processed, the numbness in the leg can get dramatically worse, you know, very quickly. And I have this scale of numbness where it comes and goes that it affects my balance and all sorts of things, my mood, all type of stuff. So um, I find it fascinating that the same approach that applies to, you know, supporting a kidney uh, challenge also supports a brain challenge and most likely a heart challenge and cancer and any other challenge. So um, I felt really comfortable that even though we weren't talking about stroke necessarily, we're going to be able to really make an impact on the people who are listening. Yeah, and, and I think, Bill, I think, look, they're great points. And I think the big thing is to to talk to people that are like you or in your situation. I think that's why your podcast is brilliant and you're getting the message out there because um, for so long I never spoke to anybody about it. You know, I, I just didn't want to talk about it. I, was, I, I felt like I was imposing upon them by giving them a burden if I actually spoke about it. But when we sat down and we talked and we connected, yeah, the similarities were definitely there. And it, it was just, um, I suppose, very human. The conversation we had was great and there is a connection. I think um, if you, you know, whatever the, whether it's stroke, whether it's uh, other illness, I think if you can support, find a support group and talk to people, mm. I think that is probably, you know, yes, diet is important. I totally agree. But I think no, the number one thing for me is talking to someone that's either been through my situation or is going through my situation mm. and just talk about it because you don't want to tell your partner, like in my case, my wife, I don't want to tell her how terrible I feel all the time. Like mm. I, but if you – Talk to someone else and you listen to what they say and, and vice versa. I think that can be um, hugely beneficial. So that's another thing that I think can uh, can help. And, and, you know, well done for you for creating this podcast to be able to do that. Yeah, well done for you for the things that you're doing, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, before we get there, it's interesting that also what you said about not necessarily giving all the information over to the partner. And um, I'll tell her if she says, oh, can we go out for a drink or whatever one particular evening? I'll say, look, I'm too tired tonight. Uh, my leg's hurting. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. But I probably haven't told her the whole day that I haven't been able to feel my leg properly since the morning. Yes. And that I struggled at work and then I struggled on the way home and, and all that kind of stuff. And I, I, don't, I do it for the same reason that you do it is that she's aware, she knows. Look, it's kind of getting old. Not you know, not in that negative kind of way, but it's kind of yes. getting old. And it's like, well, if I just tell her my leg's hurting again, what am I going to do? I mean, what, what much, how much more information is she going to have and what can she do about it? She can't do much. She can just support me and say, oh, okay, I understand. But at the end of the day, when I'm tired and she says, let's go for a drink or let's go and catch up with some people, I don't need to say much more than, look, I'm tired, leg's hurting at the moment. And she understands and she sort of says, all right, don't worry about it tonight. Um, and also, sometimes I'll tell her, look, don't make any plans for tomorrow because I'm, I'm wrecked now. I'm probably going to be wrecked tomorrow. And then what will happen is I'll wake up in the morning, had a fantastic night's sleep, and then I'll say to her, hey, guess what? Let's go. Feeling fr I'm feeling great. Let's go. I don't need to tell her that all the other stuff that goes along with it. And I'm doing it not to protect her, but I'm just doing it not to give her additional stuff to be distracted with, you know, because she's got her own life that she wants to lead and things that she wants to do do you have sort of similar reason behind why you don't pass on all the info yeah look yeah i, th I think you're dead right um and uh, look it takes a while to get get there you know i i think um yeah it's uh it, it's hard and, it's, and children as well um you know we've got two children as i said before and it's, how much do you tell of them like both of them have got a 50 50 chance of of getting what I've got. They see my mum who's, you know, nailing health. They see me who's deteriorating. And, you know, sometimes it's like with them as well. What what do you say? And, you know, it's it's once again it's that discipline of, you know, taking a higher ground. But like the easy thing to do is just let out your frustration. The harder thing to do is just pause and and I find meditation has really helped me a lot nice. in that vein. So um I just use the Headspace app, you know, ten minutes a day. And I found that that has helped me with the anger because I think 
well, for me, you know, and my situation's not that bad, but you get angry, you know, and, I, and I'm sure all your listeners have gone through a similar thing and, you know, why me, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And uh, I just find that meditating just takes that, that edge off that anger sometimes. And then I can just pause so I can be present. I can pause and then decide not to say something rather than what I used to do, which was just, you know, outwardly let it out and, uh, and talk. Where do you have to be to meditate? Some people will say, oh, I don't have time to meditate or oh, I was at work or whatever. Like, do you have to be in a specific place to stop and give yourself 10 minutes or not? Look, I'm not an expert, but what I have heard is no. Look, you know, for me, it's just what works for you. Mm. So when I did go to a psychiatrist um, about uh, the health, uh, they said just wherever you're at peace. So for me, it's in my office 10 minutes every morning. Mm. First thing I do when I wake up is I do it. That works for me. But also when I used to cycle a lot, they said that's like a meditative state because all you're doing is focusing mm. on, you know, that bike in front of you and you, you're, you know, in the in the zone, I suppose. Mm. So it's different for different people. But, um, you know, I just think that constant little voice in your head that goes off 24-7, if you can just calm that, uh, it can certainly help you. And, um, you know, like, um, you know, a lot of your listeners are, are really dealing with some really tough situations. So... It, uh, it it may help them uh, work through that. Yeah, I've found with meditation, morning is great. So the alarm might go off or I might wake up before the alarm and then stay in bed for another five or 10 minutes with the eyes closed, not necessarily thinking about what I'm meditating, just doing a kind of like a sleeping, but not really sleeping, just one of those just really chilled out zones. And sometimes before bed, I'll go and I'll pop a meditation on and I'll yes. fall asleep to it. So if it's 10 or 15 or 20 minutes, it'll end and then I'll be asleep. But I find it really sort of sets me up for a better night's sleep when I when I set the meditation. And when I'm cranky, honestly, um, during the day, which can happen a lot <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> um, I'll just go take a time out even in the car. Yes. You know, just in the car, if I'm in the shade, put the windows down and just sit there and meditate. Take five minutes and... Again, not really try a meditation or anything like that. It's just really changing my my breathing, getting out of the air, the environment that made me angry or that I made myself angry in, and then and then move on. And it is really helpful, and it costs nothing, right? It doesn't cost anything to do meditation, which is what I love about it. And on one of the other episodes that I recorded recently with one of the doctors, he talks about meditation and how um, it when you meditate yourself. When you meditate and you imagine yourself doing something better, uh, walking, recovering your your step uh, or, or your hand moving, etc., it actually fires off the same parts of the brain as if you were actually doing that walking yes. and if you were using your hand. So it's kind of like people have already had an experience with walking again, even though they may still be in a wheelchair. And I just find that fascinating that you can grow new pathways in your brain without having even done the task that uh, you want to get back. So absolutely, I love that you meditate. Um, let's talk about your work now and how you help people escape the corporate world and transition from doing something that was okay and now they're starting to dislike it or hopefully they've had a realization before you and I that maybe it t changes on the cards because they can't go forever working at 100 mile an hour. Yeah, great. And and look, all of what I'm going to say is this comes from my own personal experience plus people in that community. So, uh, you know, it's it's a very practical advice. It's not theoretical. Uh, like some of my old days at corporate, it's uh, it's very practical. And, and you know, we've got uh, two – we've got a community, but it's sort of broken into two areas. There's a, um, there's a membership – and that's sort of like an entry point, which is around the cost of a coffee a day where people can uh, get access to some some great content and in particular get access direct to me. So if they've got a question, they can just ask me and I can reply. And then we've got a, a mastermind, which is um, you know more involved, a weekly call, et cetera. But the premise is all around five simple things. So I'll just uh, run those through. Uh, first is personal productivity. So, you know, Running your own business, you're the most important asset. And most people, 
uh, underutilize their time. So it's and especially in today's world, uh, I, I did some work for Franklin Covey, which is the number one productivity training company in the world. And uh, we had the top neuroscientists in, so probably similar to some of the things that, that you've had on your, your previous episodes around um, neuroscience. But it just said, you know, effectively social media and emails like the, the new smoking is just an addiction and it's uh, so easy to take up, so hard to give 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 um, give away. So, you know, I think um, – personal productivity and getting that right is essential. And if we can save you one to two hours a day of your time that you can then spend into building your business, that is probably the greatest gift we can give you. So we've got some uh, things around that. Second is around ideal client. I think a lot of people just want anybody to be their client because they want money. They want cash. You know, Pay that's, me. that's give me something. yeah, correct. Just, just get me out of this the situation I'm in. And, and yes, I think some of that is needed, but also the quicker you can realize who your ideal client is. So on the website, someone should be able to find out exactly who you work for, i.e. who do you serve and what do you do really simply. And it's amazing how many websites you'll go to and you just don't see that. So for me, corporate escapees is really easy. I think most people get that. Mm-hmm. And then what we do is help them rapidly grow their dream business. So very simple. Uh, three is business model. So I learned a lot of this from James, but a lot of people work hard without working smart. And, you know, having the right uh, pricing models, the right way you collect cash, there's a whole lot of things that you can do to improve your business model. So you don't necessarily have to work as hard to get your money. Uh, The fourth is around sales focus. And no matter what business you're in, uh, you've got to sell. And to me, selling is just moving from someone from where they are to where they really want to be in the shortest amount of time. And uh, you need to sell and you can't avoid that no matter what business you're in until you get to, I think, at least a a million dollars in turnover and you can afford someone else. So uh, sales is both the marketing side, so it's building a brand, then uh, getting people to know and understand, like, know and trust you, and then converting that into sales. And uh, most importantly, getting results for people. I think a lot of people still focus on what they want to sell because they want the money. It's actually the other way around. You actually get someone a result and then they'll pay you. And then finally, it's a high-performing team. So now that you've got this business up and running and it's going really well, how can you get them to build a team and take off all those hats? So you might be wearing all the hats across everything how can you start taking them off there's obviously you know a va there's bookkeeping there's graphic design there's website all the stuff that you may not love to do but you think you have to do Mm. as your business starts to grow and you get more cash and and revenue in you can start to do that so that's the five-step methodology that we uh, follow and um, you know that sort of sets the framework for for everything that we do in our community yeah Awesome. The steps are really uh, simple. You're right. Uh, simple as in simple concepts to understand. Uh, I dare say people haven't had skills implementing steps in any way, shape or form in the past on their own will struggle a little bit, but that's where your community helps. So tell me about that whole new world of how we get assistance these days to do things. Because in the past, I know ten. I know when I started my business in 2005, I know that I was the marketing guy, I was the website guy, I was this guy, I was that guy, I was the quoting guy, I was the invoicing guy, I was everything. And I really did not know, because I went from a job to my own business, I really did not know that I could go to somebody else and say, do my accounts for me. But also at the same time, I didn't want to spend the money on them because I thought that it was not It was a waste of money. And I thought that that was going to take me away from I'm not sure what what I quickly realized and hopefully the people that are listening here will quickly realize is that when you invest money in somebody doing your book work it keeps you off of the book work and therefore allows you to grow your business and it allows you to work on the business not in the business so your what are the what are the new tools that are available for people these days to help them in growing the business. You mentioned the VA. Let's start with that, which is a virtual assistant. Yeah. What is well, a virtual assistant? Yeah, look, it's the first thing I was going to say. And uh, a virtual assistant, and, and 
And I'll just, um, well, I'll tell you what it is, and then I'll give you a context which uh, may be relevant to, to your audience. Uh, so a VA is a, a virtual assistant, and effectively, back in the old days, uh, you know, everyone had a secretary. Uh, if you're a business person, you had a secretary, they opened the mail, they sorted it all through, and then basically you just did what you had to do, but they did all the rest of it. And with technology, that was meant to sort of remove all of that. If anything, it's actually gone the other way that you're bombarded by stuff now. So to me, you still need a, a second pair of hands, as I call it. So uh, they can be local. So it can be a uni student. Um, it can be there's some good groups in Australia that um, if your audience are in Australia or you can go overseas like I did uh, in the Philippines. And effectively, I think of it as is just that second pair of hands where they can do anything that isn't the best use of my time. And uh, the example that I'll, I'll give you is um, my builder. So uh, I've just built a, a new house and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's fantastic, but I just saw him doing a lot of stuff in his work that I thought, you don't need to do that. You don't need to order that container and go in and fill the form. And, you know, he's so frustrated by that. I'm like, just, I just pick up Facebook Messenger and just say, can you order this from that and let go? And then bang, that gets done by my VA overseas. But then he's also got a, a child who's very ill. So at uh, nine months old, he, he uh, contracted a virus and now can effectively only use his eyes. So he's in a wheelchair. He's, he's completely dependent upon his parents. And so his dad's trying to do the building business. His wife's helping him with the book work. And effectively, they've got a full-time job, which is their son. And they've got another son. So they are really tight for time. And I'm like, you know, you can just take so much of that and give it to a virtual assistant that might cost you between eight to $10 an hour. But just think of all of the saving that you're going to get to do the stuff that's quality because you're not returning sales calls of businesses that could be worth $700,000 to you a deal or $500,000 because you're off doing all this other stuff yeah, that a VA could do. So um, I think it's the number one thing as a small business owner you should have. Um, we've got some brilliant resources, and I'll give you some links post this because uh, we've um, I used to have a company, I sold it, but now we use some great partners. So I can certainly refer your group to them. But I, I think it's uh, huge, and and even for me with you know organising all my specialists, all of that stuff, it's just so much easier with someone else doing that uh, for me. Wow. Um, so that's that. And then the other thing is the technology. I think you just need to have the right technology yeah. stack to make it real. And there's some brilliant technology out there these days that it's, it's, it's free. It doesn't cost you much at all that you can be anywhere in the world and you can uh, get your, your team, i.e. your virtual team to do things for you. So uh, if I was going to give your audience one gift, it would be that gift. Get a VA, set up the right technology and um, it'll make life uh, a lot better, both in business and also personal. Yeah, I love it. And for the people watching on YouTube and the people listening on iTunes, we, you and I, are doing that exactly now. We've found a way to connect using Skype, a recording software that records directly from Skype that allows us to have a one-hour meeting that doesn't waste an hour of me getting to your place and then recording the interview and then driving an hour back to my place and then having to sit down and do the work that's associated to editing, etc. So it's extremely efficient in the way that we utilize this time. And imagine me now trying to get an interview with a world leading neuroscientist from California. It would have been impossible in the past, A, for me to just manage that process with their particular VA or whoever, I would have had to call overseas I'd have to make an appointment, book a flight, pay thousands and thousands of dollars to potentially not get a dollar value return in all of the effort that was made to do that. And what you said was interesting about the builder is that I wonder if the builder has understood the concept of, well, let's go out and meet the client in the first instance and then let's have Skype sessions with them for the two, three or four um, times that we need to before they sign a contract and decide to give us the work. I wonder if your builder has had the opportunity to sort of take the leap since you've given them some uh, feedback. Look, uh, we're certainly progressing in that way, and uh, you know he he'll he'll take those steps. But I've got another person in our community, uh, so shout shout out to Nick Beldo, 
He's doing a brilliant job, ex-IBM guy. Now he's running his own business in the US and it's a renovation and home mod- remodeling business. And he does that. So now he screens his clients because sometimes he's driving an hour, hour and a half, realizing it's the wrong client. The wow. client you know, doesn't always give you the right information. Wow. There's a three hours gone, right? Yeah. So uh, he, he's using technology to better screen and it gives them um, a better fit as well because they haven't wasted their time on talking to the wrong builder. So wow. look, and it's interesting, you know, there's booking systems out there at the moment that are completely free that you can set up. And I sent a link to someone before I was referred to someone, sent a link and he chopped back after, well, actually he didn't reply. So I said, oh, you know, just bumping this to the top of your emails again. He said, look, I didn't reply because you sent me a link. I thought it was very rude. And, you know, it's still amazing that, um, oh. you know, it's considered rude, whereas, no, it's actually trying to save you time. So you can just quickly look at a time that suits you. We can have a quick Skype or I use Zoom call, and then you can see if it's the right thing for you. So there's a 15-minute exercise rather than let's go and meet for a coffee. There's a three-hour, two-hour exercise. And the one thing I would say is I wish specialists would do more of this. Like, you know, it takes us three months to get into some of our specialists yeah. at the moment. So, like, why can't they use technology a lot more? And I know they're frustrated by it. And, and some of the startups that we're looking to fund at the moment is to help in that space because they are just building two things that I spent a lot of time in the last 12 months. One is the building industry that I spoke of. The other was health. And I just cannot believe how poor the technology that they use and to run a, a small business I have clients all over the world. I do it all from, you know, this office, it's really easy. And then specialists know I have to go and meet them in yeah. person. You know, it's just so inefficient, but the great news is that's going to change. And I think you've just got to be, you know, an early adopter. So mm. if you're listening to this and you're not onto it, it's so peep, so simple. Like my parents, my mum said, I, I can't use Skype. It sounds too difficult or whatever. She tried it within two minutes. She said, this is simple. I said, I told you it was. It's just the fear that in the old days, your PC or or whatever never worked and it used to crash and, you know, everyone hated it. Mm. Whereas these days, you know, with mobile phones and all, it's it's easy. It just works. It, it doesn't have to be as frustrating as what you think it might be. Yeah. I, I love what you said about um, doctors because, unfortunately, those, do- those guys, um, they're in an industry that – completely overworks them and mm. it, it may seem and it, it may seem amazing at the beginning that there's a three-month wait to see a doctor and i'm going to always have work if i'm a doctor but at what expense do you know what i mean um, the same expense that we suffer and the same health issues that we suffer doctors potentially suffer so um i i, I would love to see and hear of a time where eventually we're going in to see the doctor to literally do our blood pressure, those types of things when it's necessary. And then for the results call, we can just zoom zoom in or Skype in and just get our results one-on-one with the doctor from their office. And they haven't had us driving in Melbourne traffic. I don't know which city you guys um, live in. If you're living in any city across the Western world or even in the developing world, Traffic is an absolute terrible time for me to sit through. It's stressful or does all those things, not making us any better. So I love what you're saying. I love the fact that you're working in health and I love the fact that you're working with builders because my previous um, main gig was you know, in the property maintenance game. Yes. And I used to do that and I never screened my clients. I used to take a call and I think, right, I'm going to spend you know, Monday of the week and Tuesday of the week running around doing all the quotes and I did exactly what you said. I worked on the premise that if I got, you know, ten percent of the jobs that came in via the inquiries, then I would have a successful business. But man, I was working sixteen hours a day, seventeen hours a day. <laughs> yeah. Another yeah, day. and it's all and it's all about compounding, right? Like the the most successful people in the world just compound good action. Mm. So and the biggest skill, and we sort of talked about this at the start of the interview, it's all about saying no. Like if you get to the absolute core of it, it's just about saying no to most things and then saying right, yes to the right things. So yes to the right foods, yes to, you know, meditating and looking after your mind, yes to getting a VA and then the VA does all the noise and therefore by default you're saying no to everything. Mm. And, you know, and it's also saying yes to the important things that are going to be 
critical to your health and then saying no to everything else. So so I think that's uh, really important. But look, it, it'll, it'll definitely improve. Um, uh, but, you know, just talk to your, your specialist or talk to your doctor and just see if there's ways that you can be a bit more creative. I'm now like using email a lot more with my specialist. And, uh, you know, I know that sometimes can save me you know, the three months of not waiting, I can ask her quick questions. I'll set up a Google sheet now with all my blood pressure results. So if she wants to see my blood pressure, she can go in at any time and she, you know, sees the ups and the downs. She can then, uh, you know, take action. So she's got access to that. That's easy. That's just a Google. That's cost amazing. me nothing. Wow. Set it up. She can access it at any time. So I think that's uh, there. And I think the other one is that in the US now, you can actually get bloods. So if someone comes – Take your, uh, you take your bloods or they take your bloods, goes off, they basically get the results and then they, they call you uh, with the results. But what they're also doing now is around stressful situations. So they'll monitor you. So uh, they'll actually have live, um, you know, like a, an Apple a watch or a equivalent and it'll mo- monitor your key vitals. And if your um, heart pressure is going too high or something, they'll actually alert you and say you need to – get out of this situation or you need to do whatever. So it's going to move a lot more to the preventative rather than nice. unfortunately for a lot of us, which is too far down the track and it's all about reactive. How do we fix when, you know, for you having a stroke, like it happened too late, didn't it? Like, yeah. you know, once the stroke happened, um, but how can they do a lot of things that are more preventative, which is also great that's happening down the, uh, the it's certainly happening in the US and, and I'm sure it'll all uh, come here soon. Yeah, that's amazing. So tell me a little bit about your podcast because you also have a, an amazing podcast. I listened to a few of the episodes uh, since we've met. Tell me about that and how it came to be. Yeah, so uh, it's just about uh, spreading that word. So, um, you know, it's a bit like here. It's a bit isolating, I suppose. You you handle your situation. You might talk to a few people now and again, but um, I think it's great to talk to people, but it's also great to hear people's stories and, and listen to. So I couldn't find anywhere in the world that had corporate escapees talking about uh, their experiences and what they went through. So um, we basically created a podcast that was called Build, Live, Give to begin with. And now we're ta- uh, changing that name to Corporate Escapees by Build, Live, Give. And it just uh, interviews people uh, that have uh, worked in corporate that have uh, left they're building their dream business. So it talks about the, the challenges and the and the struggles that they've had, talks about their life. So what what leaving corporate gives them. So, you know, it talks about their daily habits and how they run their life now, which is often very different to what it was in corporate. And then finally, it's about give, which is something that they can give back. And uh, it talks about a cause that they love or a community that they support. So a little bit like what you're doing for this community. So uh that's the podcast you know we'd love to get um more great guests on so if any of your community knows anyone who's a corporate escapee running their own business we'd love to uh, get them on the show and uh yeah the the um the feedback so far has been uh, has been excellent because uh what i love about podcasts is you can just speed it up so i listen at two times speed uh, sometimes i listen to two and a half times speed and you know, you can choose through a half an hour podcast in 15 minutes whilst you're hanging out the washing or, you know, driving to your next appointment or whatever it may be. Yeah. And how good is it? Um, again, that's bringing a product that's free into the world where people can actually get a lot of amazing information about how to start making those changes in their lifestyle and leap out of you know what they're currently doing which they don't like or is not serving them anymore into a new part of you know themselves or a different version or a different way of being themselves and running a business um, so that's a classic example of technology working in our favor and us you know needing to accept it and leverage it and use it so that you know we can learn and start to feel comfortable with the idea that we had and the change that we're going to make finding people that uh, online that we haven't met but that we can appreciate their stories because we're going through something different and then give us the opportunity through giving to share what we've learned with somebody else yeah I look love it's that part of your i love you that part of your message the give part yeah great thanks and and look it's um you know people say are you gonna go 
do further education. I'm like, every day I'm educating myself. I never stop. I listen to two hours of podcasts at two and a half times speed a day, and I'm just constantly learning, and it's brilliant. It's all free, and, um, you know, it's free in the fact that it doesn't cost anything to put it out there, but I think you can make a huge impact on people's lives by the action that's taken uh, post post uh, listening to that information yeah and the best part about a podcast is you can listen to it if you happen to be driving for an hour anywhere you can listen to it in the car you can listen to it at night you can switch the tv off and instead of getting bamboozled by all the programming that that's on tv you can listen to a podcast and learn something and you could get a lot out of it and you haven't done anything really different to gain that knowledge you've actually just included it as part of your day yeah and, and i just want to um just back to the VA point, I'll just give a, a really clear example. So I'll walk my dog. At, uh, it's about lunchtime here. I'm about to walk the dog. It'll come and remind me that uh, it's time for its walk. So we go for a walk. I'll listen to a podcast. And uh, as soon as I get an actionable item, so we um, collect supplies all around the world. That's one of the key benefits of being in our community. And uh, we vet the suppliers and they're on there so that people you know, don't make mistakes with picking the wrong supplier. But I'll hear a supplier on a podcast. I'll just pause the podcast. I'll just go to my Facebook Messenger and just go, can you add ABC supplier to the list to basically be vetted? Thank you. Release my finger, go back to listening to the podcast. So I'm not collecting all those actions to actually, you know, Do queue up at some other time. It's happening instantaneously and it's happening with someone who in the Philippines is loving the fact that they're working with a global a person and a global community while they they can live with their their friends and, and family so they they're winning I'm winning and our community's winning so once again I really implore you to to look at that so listen but the most important thing is to take the action off what you're listening to yeah fantastic uh, action uh, an idea without action is basically nothing really we need to take the action follow through and um, look back reflect on where we've come from and see how much we've grown, what we've learned, what we've accomplished, celebrate the wins. And if you feel like you're lonely, get involved in a meetup. Now, um, do you, as part of your organization, or I beg your pardon, as part of your membership, do people uh, get together and meet in person? The short answer is no. Um, not at the yet. We, our community, I think, needs to grow a little bit more in size. Uh, before we do that but that's our plan our plan is to have local meetups all over the world and what i'm really waiting for is a community big enough that we've got people that uh, want to uh, take that on and uh, and help that but that's probably uh, at least another 12 months away yeah. but i but i fully recommend well i think it's great i think with super fast business what james does i think it's great i wouldn't have met you that's right uh, if, if it wasn't for that reason so i think there's a real place for it um but uh we're a little bit off off that at the moment yeah that's all right and the reason i mentioned it was exactly that because i wanted to make the point that you and i we met at a meetup that i i never would have bumped into you anywhere else because we don't sort of hang around in the same circles and this meetup of amazing different people uh, from all different communities and yet we've found uh, a really a lot of things that we have in common and uh, we have similar out uh, similar goals similar ideas of how we'd love to help people as well as ourselves uh, so um, I would encourage people to just jump on meetup.com, have a bit of a search for the things that they're interested in, their uh, hobbies or whatever it is, and see if you can find people in your local area that are going to um, be able to share you know, their little story and listen to your story and change ideas. And now you feel like, okay, I'm not the only person in the world who loves watching stars you know, through a telescope uh, in the middle of the night. Yeah, and I think the great point, or to build on that point, is that if you can't find it, create it, right? So I couldn't find a community for corporate escapees anywhere in the world, and I'd, I'd sort yeah, of complain yeah. about it, you know? <laughs> but I got off my backside and created it. So nice. if you can't find it, go out and create it. Nice, nice. Mate, we are getting to that point. We're coming to the end of the episode. This has been an amazing chat, um, just like the first time we got together and had a chat. So I really appreciate you for doing what you do, sharing what you're sharing and making time for me to share it to my community. I truly appreciate it. I look forward to getting to know you more and uh, even I I'd say from time to time sending people across to you because I've got a feeling that I'll come across a lot of people in my community who are challenged by the current work that they're doing and they'll need 
to make that change. Um, if anyone listening thinks that this episode is uh, interesting, please do share it in your community and let people know about Paul's community and what it is that they do. How can people find your uh, you online and your community online? Yeah, so just go to buildlivegive.com. And over there we'll find links of the podcast episodes uh, and what the membership is about and all the different things that they can do to uh, sort of get involved. Yep, one-stop shop. You'll find uh, everything there. And uh, and I just want to quickly say uh, thanks for you because I know that you know, you're know you one of those people that have created a community because you had a, a niche and uh, you couldn't find anything out there. So uh, well done to that. But also really well done to your community. Like I talk about my kidney disease, but it's nothing like some of what you guys are going through. And uh, you know, just take a moment now to to actually uh, congratulate yourself on being so brave and and working through whatever you're working through. Uh, you know, I take my hat off to you. I know there's a, a lot of people out here, out there, a lot uh, unhealthier than I am. And I really, uh, you inspire me and you encourage me. So uh, well done for what you're doing. Yeah, thank you, mate. Well, mate, all the best and thanks for being on the show. Cheers, Bill. Well, thanks for listening to this episode of the Recovery After Stroke podcast. If you like this episode or any other episode, please hit the like button if you're watching on social media. Give us a thumbs up if you are watching on YouTube and give the Recovery After Stroke podcast a five-star review on your favorite podcast app. Doing that will make the podcast more visible to other stroke survivors that are doing it tough right now and it could help them feel inspired and feel better about the road ahead. Thanks for tuning in. Discover how to heal your brain after stroke. Go to recoveryafterstroke.com. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The Content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call 000 if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy currency or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk and we are not responsible for any information you find there.